So as you see, uh, if you have, uh, I, I love to have very good qualified questions at the end because at the end, that's where all the things that I've forgotten to say is what you're going to make me say by uh, by stating very good questions. Also, I <laughs> tend to. Um, to surprise myself with what I say sometimes, and then it's kind of funny if that happens, uh, if that ends up on Twitter. So if anyone likes to eat uh, Swedish licorice, uh, you will get that if you do a good question or if you do a good tweet. Um, there, this one. Who am I? Um, I'm a software tester. Um, I'm a security tester to be. Uh, a little bit of DevOps, a little bit of everything. I also am a maker. I really, really love making LEDs like those, uh, wearable LEDs. And I have a chip implant. And sometimes I go uh, and talk about that as well. Um, it's too bad I had a really nice uh, presenter mode before, and I don't have that anymore. I will have to do. This piece of art here is very well known in Sweden. Uh, it's painted by uh, an artist called Jon Bauer, and uh, it's been said that the model for uh, this little elf in the middle is his wife, Esther Elkvist Bauer, who was also an artist. And in 1918, they were going to take a boat over the big lake Vetten in Sweden, uh, up to Stockholm. Um, they had the option of going by train. But uh, about one month earlier, there had been a huge landslide. And because of the landslide, the railroad um, simply disappeared, and 42 people died in uh, a fiery inferno um, train accident. Therefore, they felt uh, it didn't feel really safe going by train. Boats are much, much safer. And so they bought a ticket for that uh, boat. Um, another person, person who also bought, bought a ticket for that boat is Victor Fong, which is my great-grandfather, my uh, mother's mother's father. He was a uh, yellow metal worker, founder. Uh, basically, he's making chandeliers for churches. And one of these days, he was going to take this chandelier uh, up Lake Vettan on the boat. Um, he also bought a ticket. And it was very bad weather. It was in November. Uh, Sweden in November is well known for not being like Thailand, but more <laughs> um, kind of awful. And the boat sank. And the people on the shipping, uh, in the shipping company, they went to, through the manifesto, and they saw Victor Fong on the manifesto, went to his wife and said, we are very sorry to inform you that your uh, husband is dead. And this would be devastating for them, because they had seven children. And uh, the wife, Ellen Fong, said, no, well, no, he isn't dead, he's in the workshop. Uh, it turns out that he was the only person who was denied entrance, although he had a ticket. For some reason, one skipper said, you're not, um, this is not the boat that you're going on. And he, uh, we don't know why, because that skipper also died. So, uh, Victor Fong was the sole survivor of the boat accident Per Braue in 1918. And what's also interesting about this story, and the reason why I want to talk about it, is that 360 days later, my grandmother was born. So, that's kind of crazy. Um, there was an uh, investigation into what had happened in this accident. Um, as much as two-thirds of the cargo was put on deck. Uh, this cargo was also unlashed, so it wasn't anchored to anything, but it was just standing there. There were sewing machines, it was uh, potatoes, 
Uh, it would have been a chandelier, but it wasn't. Um, and they were standing on top of the boat instead of downstairs. And I think uh, also at the time it was common knowledge that if you're having a boat, you need to put the weight down below, because if you don't do that, uh, it will tip over in bad weather, which is also what happened. Um, this uh, accident investigation blamed the captain for all of it. They said it was bad seamanship, but in reality, the shipping company had a bonus system, that, uh, and it was put into system throughout the, um, throughout the industry, basically, that you do put uh, cargo on top of the boat instead of down below. And if you look at this boat, like, I don't know, who would blame them? 1918, Sweden was uh, uh, one of the most poor countries uh, in Europe. We didn't have democracy, we didn't have... Um, people didn't have food. A fourth of the population was in America. Um, so everybody who's working is working very, very long days. And naturally, uh, like, without knowing, but it looks like you know, they wouldn't even have stairs to go down uh, with a cargo, but you have to go by a ladder. And if you're having a big sewing machine, how are you going to take it down there? It's very, very hard if you're designing a system, or in this case, a steamboat, a 100-year-old steamboat at the time, too, because it was born in or 70. It was built in 1950s, something. Um, it's just very, very hard to do the right thing. These people are already working very, very much for a very, very little wage, and these tickets are already very expensive. Uh, so there is a best practice, a best practice that will save lives, but still it is uh, disregarded by most. So, um, as far as I know, uh, shipping didn't become very much secure until we have a technical solution uh, that makes it drastically cheaper uh, to um, unload and load ships. You don't have to balance with ladders, but you have to, um, uh, you're solving things with technology, and it's much, much easier to uh, operate these uh, this kinds of boats safely. Uh, therefore, we also have much, much more cargo, because it's much cheaper and much better. So, I would argue that the IT business is as mature as other businesses, like civil engineering or shipping engineering, uh, were a hundred years ago. And my hope is that the general data protection regulation uh, that is coming into force now in May uh, will be one of many steps into making IT safe and secure. Um, but we don't know this. Like, I'm very enthusiastic about GDPR, but that's also simply because uh, it's not there yet. Uh, no one has been fined yet, and we don't know how it will be interpreted. We do know what the law says, however, and I think that the law in itself is quite radical. So, since we don't know how this will actually be interpreted, uh, we can g I can give you absolutely no answers about what, this, what the GDPR actually is, but I can define a problem set to uh, assess your own systems by. Uh, but for that, um, one of my bigger, biggest idols is called Bruce Schneier. He's an IT security guru, or whatever. Uh, he's writing a book right now on how we can regulate the Internet of Things. Um, he thinks that there are two paradigms of security. One that is the highly regulated security, uh, the highly regulated security of dangerous things. Dangerous things are things that will kill you if it goes wrong, like boats or medication or buildings or electricity. Um, 
This works with uh, harsh legislations and pre-certifications. So, for example, if you have a medicine that will be miraculous and uh, cure cancer and HIV and everything at the same time, you still have to go through a 10-year process before you let it go into the market. Whereas we in the IT business, we can, you know, we can ship anything all the time. Uh, so this paradigm of highly regulated security, it inhibits innovation, but it prevents failure, and therefore it also prevents death. Whereas we have the agile, patchable security of previously benevolent things, and um, that's uh, in software and stuff. Uh, or, for example, when it comes to environmental seals, we also very much see this like a voluntary approach or a um, approach with uh, shaming or with um, trying to pressure uh, pressure. Uh, an industry into doing something. Um, and the agile, par agile patchable security paradigm, it promotes innovation and it accepts failure. And that was okay, as long as we didn't have internet-connected cars. That was okay as long as, um, you know, for example, Tesla, Uh, during one of the storms in Florida, they simply sent out a patch uh, for people that were driving Tesla cars so that they could drive um, um, a longer distance on their batteries. Uh, so that was really nice in that case. But they didn't ask for permission in, uh, in advance. Is this something that we really want? Do we want companies to be able to... Uh, update our uh, software over the air when it just like that. I don't know. So, how come dangerous things are reasonably safe? So, in the case of the boat, Pärbra, in 1918, I think uh, one of those boats, uh, those tickets must have been very expensive. It's something that most people couldn't afford. Um, so there must be some kind of equilibrium where uh, it's secure enough so that people buy tickets at the price that they can afford it. Then there's an accident happening. Um, most of the times there is no accident happening, uh, but some other times there is. And when that, that accident happens, uh, usually there is a cause that is determined, and hopefully the cause that they find is actually the one that was actually causing the accident. Um, yeah, politics, market, and people, they push for better security, and we get better tech, or we get a more expensive product, or we get some kind of pre-legislation. Most of the time we get all three at the same time, and we don't really know for sure which one of them necessarily is the one that causes things to start working, uh, or the things to get better. Sometimes the new technology will also make things worse, and very often <laughs> the new legislation will, make, uh, will maybe solve that thing, but it doesn't solve, it causes another problem. Anyway, we will end up with a new equilibrium uh, of profit versus caution, and we will probably have something that is a bit more safe. Um, so we can see now that medicine is probably more safe than it was 50 years ago. We don't have a new uh, contagon accident every, every week. Um, and this feedback loop works because we people care about dying. We don't want to die. So there is a market pressure because people don't want to die. People, uh, politicians think that people don't want to die, and therefore they want more, better legislation. Um, whereas in IT, we still don't really care about the fuck-ups that happen. But hopefully we'll do very soon.
Uh, so let's go over to the GDPR. Um, what's the most important thing about the GDPR is that uh, European citizens own their own privacy data. And in order for us to invoke our, right, uh, our rights as owners of our data, um, IT systems need to be built with privacy by design. Both of these things, what are privacy data, what is privacy by design? Uh, we also need uh, to have informed and granular consent, and we who, uh, who collect and process data, we cannot anymore say, oh, I didn't know that uh, an unencrypted S3 bucket was unencrypted. I'm sorry, um, but we, uh, you will actually be fined. But you won't be fined before. Uh, an interesting thing is that you can have two equally bad systems, and only one of them will have a breach, and that's the one that will be fined, probably. And the other one will just, oops, we patched this. No one noticed. Great, we, don't, we won't be fined. That's something that might happen, but we don't really know yet, because, as we know, it hasn't happened yet. When it comes to the GDPR, we often talk about personally identifiable information, and this is actually something that is not inside the European legislation, but personally identifiable information is something that they can talk about in the US, for example. And there it is very, very clearly defined what is and what isn't personally identifiable information. Whereas here, uh, account should be taken to all the means reasonably likely to be used. Um, what does this mean? Is the data that my air conditioning uh, is collecting, is that personally identifiable information? Um, let's see what an air conditioner will may know about me? Well, it must have three sensors to function. Um, if it's an... Um, we need a temperature sensor so that we can regulate up or down uh, whether we should heat or whether we should cool. Uh, we need a carbon dioxide sensor so that the air inside will not be too bad and we need a humidity sensor also so that we don't feel super dry or super humid. And what can we learn from this data? Well, we can learn, since a person is uh, expelling both temperature and carbon, carbon dioxide and humidity, we can see where, when people come home we can see how many people are in the room uh, or in the house. We can see where they are. Um, we can see when they shower. There's a very, very uh, interesting peak uh, when people shower. We can see whether they're sleeping. Uh, we can see when they, are, um, uh, when they are working out on their indoor treadmill. We can also see uh, when they are having sex, how many, people that are involved, and in what room. Um, so, I would argue that uh, looking back at what is personally identifiable information, um, all the data that your air conditioning is collecting on you uh, will be regarded as um, personally identifiable information, and therefore is data that um, is included under the GDPR. Yeah, I just put that there. <laughs> so if you're gonna uh, look into what your own IT system is doing at the moment to see whether or not you're GDPR compliant, uh, you first need to know what privacy data does your project handle at the moment, and that turns out to be kind of hard for very many people to do, if you have a legacy system, for example. Uh, but you can try by starting to do an inventory about 
what kind of data your system uh, is currently collecting on people, uh, what you have in your mailboxes or whatever, depending on what kind of company you are. Uh, you have to know, yeah, you have to know your system and what it does. You have to know how it's supposed to work. If it does work in that way, then you also have to apply a hacker mindset and try to break it and see uh, whether it actually, whether there are side channels or whether it actually works the way it's supposed to and only that way. Um, and if you find out that this kind of assessment is kind of hard to do, well, there's a very simple solution. Just throw everything away and start over. <laughs> because if you, if you don't have uh, these things in the bag, uh, it's very, very hard to become compliant. But if you do have these things in, uh, in the bag, it is easy to be compliant. Um, next questions to ask yourself is, how do we ensure privacy by design? Uh, who can access it? And why? And can we limit the amount of data we keep? And I think uh, the two first questions... Um, no. I don't know if uh, anyone here have heard about uh, this journalist that was using Google Docs to write an article about uh, violations against wildlife. And uh, she was uh, blocked from using her uh, work tool, Google Docs. Uh, they said that, well, there's a, a violation of terms and conditions. And this turned out to be a bug, and um, Google very soon said, oops, uh, here you go, here's your account back. Uh, but it raises a very interesting question. Uh, why did Google go through her data in the first place? Well, um, of course, there's not a person doing this, but this is automatically happening. Uh, this is a design paradigm that I would call uh, privacy invasion by design, uh, so that you intentionally um, give the company that um, is owning the software the possibility to uh, automatically read uh, what, um, what anyone is putting into the system. Um, and another mu municipality in Sweden, uh, in Gothenburg, where I come from, uh, they were doing a rollout of uh, Office 365 uh, to tens of thousands of employees. Uh, the problem is that they hadn't told the, um, the information security people about this, and they um, pulled the emergency brake and said, stop, 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 stop. Um, the Microsoft Office 365 is not designed with privacy by design, uh, but anyone who has access, uh, has high privilege within Microsoft can read um, sensitive data uh, about the citizens of Gothenburg. Um, and that's uh, not acceptable to them. Um, so these two examples are systems that are made uh, with that um, design paradigm. Uh, and there are obviously many nice things about knowing, uh, about keeping a lot of data. Um, you can do a lot of quantitative analysis. Uh, but what can also happen is, of course, that uh, if an American company has the possibility of reading the data, um, that means that, you, uh, that the company can be subpoenaed to, um, to give out that data, and that will break other laws, uh, like secrecy laws in Sweden about citizens. Um, if you're using this kind of uh, design paradigm, you will also 
uh, have a lot more uh, data to protect and to ensure that it's not actually being used in a bad way. Um, this is the design paradigm that we've been living under for a long time, saying that data is the new oil. Uh, on the other side, we have systems like Signal Messaging App, uh, which I think many other people at this conference is using. Uh, I use it every day, basically. Uh, and here we treat data as toxic waste, and almost everything is thrown away. Signal knows two pieces of information about me, basically, when I signed up and when I sent my last message. They don't know to whom. They don't know the content. Uh, they don't keep any kind of metadata about anything. Uh, with, uh, this makes them uh, virtually immune towards um, subpoenas from the American state. Uh, but that also makes them not uh, being able to collaborate in fighting crimes, uh, which are obviously is something that you have to think about. Um, but one good thing about this is also that uh, since you don't have data, that data can't be compromised, it can't be taken over by hackers, and therefore this will be GDPR compliance kind of by design. So over to the question of informed consent. Um, I like to think of the end-user license agreements that we are used to, the ones that we cl simply click, I accept. Um, they don't really work under the GDPR. Um, and I, would, I, I think of them in a way like... Um, martial arts versus assault. When you're doing martial arts, you have a limited scope and a limited of in time and space where you're allowed to beat someone up. When that limited scope uh, is over, you do not have any rights at all to uh, fight that person in any way. Um, and in the same way under the GDPR, we are allowed to give away our personally identifiable information to uh, another entity for a limited scope uh, in time and space. And we have the right to uh, revoke those. We have the right, um, yeah, because they're basically ours. Uh, so even if someone is a boxer, they don't have the right to beat someone up in the street. Or even if someone is a boxer, uh, they don't have it coming if they get mugged. Um. In the GDPR, uh, the kind of data that we do collect uh, under consent and after we have been asking ourselves what do we really need and what do we really want, uh, we have to protect it. Now, we cannot uh, claim uh, that we didn't know anymore. Uh, and how do we do that? Well, it's easy. Encrypt all the things. My last question is, um, will any of this even matter? Will the law be circumvented anyway? I don't know. I think that the Cambridge Analytica scandal came at a very, very good time, uh, because now it's on the top of the mind of very many people that uh, privacy data, when used wrongly, can be um, used in a very, very bad way. So I hope that that means that what will basically happen is that since this is on the top of, of people's mind, people will care in the same way that people care about that they don't want to die when they're taking the boat. Um, they also don't want their privacy data to be used uh, for nefarious purposes. So I really hope that uh, <laughs> I am 
right about thinking that the GDPR is awesome and that the GDPR is going to be a part of the solution uh, for making the IT business a little bit more secure and safe. Thank you. Well, thank you. <laughs> Um, are there any, que any questions? I think the implications for businesses are uh, something we are looking forward to um, as private persons and uh, so on. But what does it mean for open groups like uh, you have a topic group, and you have a mailing list, and you have a website, and so on. Um, basically, uh, this applies there too. Do I have to shut down these services, or what's about third-party services? Like I have a third-party tool that I use, um, and so on. Is there already um, something that can be said about it? Well. I think it's a good idea to simply do an inventory about what you have, what your system actually looks like. Um, and, if, you know, it's a very simple thing. Just start with a checklist of what, what are we doing? Uh, what do we need this thing here? Um, when was the last time that we uh, asked people on this uh, mailing list whether they wanted to be in there? Maybe we should ask people to opt out, or maybe we should even say opt in in order to stay on the list, for example. Um, that said, I don't think that, or I <laughs> sincerely hope that uh, open groups uh, are not going to be the first ones to be <laughs> fined. Um, also, simply because there is no money to find for. Um, we don't know. More questions? You were talking about the feedback loop because people don't want to buy and how to improve security on ships. Um, what do you think about the difference in the feedback loop, uh, feedback <laughs> loop regarding security for people and for technologists? Normal people think, okay, I'm writing a chat message to something, I don't care, I use it. And uh, technologists think differently. <laughs> do you think that this is a problem, that the feedback loop does not work for normal people? I'm not fully sure what the... Um I do not understand the question, actually. I'm sorry. Uh, the feedback loop is easy to understand with ships and I don't want to die. Mm -hmm. But uh, security and protection of my personal data, there are many customers of services like chat systems and so on that don't care about it. <laughs> Yes. So uh, we have a feedback loop for the customers, what they think and how they react. We have a feedback loop for politics and for technic, yeah. technic people, affinity people like us. So there are three different loops and uh, all react differently. So how do we, do we want to bring this together? Well, I, I think that, well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't have to know everything, I'm sorry. Um, we are all different, and we all react in different ways, obviously. And uh, I, I'm also uh, guilty of going into the fallacy as a security person to think that it, because I think that end-to-end -end encryption is the most important uh, feature of any kind of product, then naturally everybody else will think that too. And then all of a sudden it turns out that, why? Like, Oh, it turns out that usability is the thing that people actually care about. Uh, I think that uh, it's important that uh, we security people uh, collaborate more with user experience and that we, um, that we throw away in the bin the fallacy 
that um, uh, security and usability are uh, things that don't go together. I don't know if that was a, um, an answer, but there was another question, yeah, there. Uh, good evening. Until this moment, I didn't know uh, it came or that it is planned this uh, this new policy of the data regulation. I have many questions. We can talk here another two hours, but uh, small question and answer if possible. Uh, how long is prepared this this new policy regulation by EU? How many years or how long is planned? How uh, how long they have been planning it? Yeah. Well. Uh, the old legislation, uh, the old data protection regulation is from 1994, I think, something like that. Um, and since then, there has been a lot of things happening. Um, I don't know, but uh, it has been, uh, it has been uh, the legislation in, the Euro in Europe for uh, the past two years, but no one has been fined for it. Um, the deadline is in a few weeks. The deadline is in a few weeks, indeed. After which you, you are fine if you don't do this. Yeah. Yes. I have a lot of questions. Other people mm. can do that. But I'd love to speak to you afterwards and answer any, any other questions. So, more questions? Hi, good evening. I'm an old IT guy and I'm, I'm looking in the IT area for the hype of storing the data in the cloud. Big companies are offering us all uh, uh, features to store our data in the cloud. Office 365, you mentioned in your presentation. What do you think about it? I think in the US they all have no problem with this, but I see big problems here in Germany and in Europe for this uh, business? Well, the, the um, um, privacy law that precedes the GDPR, uh, it stated that uh, the one who is collecting the data is the one who is responsible for it being stored securely. Um, and then after this regulation um, legislation was done, uh, we migrated everything into the cloud, meaning that the ones who had the, um, the legal obligation to secure the data were the one who, ones who were oblivious of the way it was secured because they had been giving over that kind of control to the hosting providers. Uh, in the new GDPR, uh, this uh, responsibility is shared between the one who collects the data and the one who is uh, storing the data. Um, was that some kind of answer to your question? Yes, but uh, it's not uh, directly um, attached to, to the GDPR uh, law now, but it's the overall uh, view of storing data in the cloud. Yeah? If you store your data in a cloud, in the cloud provider who is located in the US, I think the US government has access to your data. Yeah, so a and any kind of system that is not designed with privacy design in mind, or privacy by design in mind, or that uh, doesn't allow for uh, privacy by design to happen, um, I think is a very big problem. Um, and we don't know yet whether or not uh, these systems that are not designed with privacy in, uh, by design in mind uh, but by privacy invasion by design in mind, uh, whether they are going to be even legal or not. I think that they are going to be legal because these uh, companies are kind of big and have a lot of lobby, lobby money. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think that uh, we are such an innovative uh, community um, and because we don't have to work with pre-certifications, but we, ha we can just try things and see if it works. Mm -hmm. We're using the patchable, agile paradigm of security. Um, we can just try something and see what happens. 
and many of these systems will actually be very, very good. Um, so I think that even though uh, things like uh, Google Docs and uh, Office 365 will still be there and they will still be very lucrative to use because it might be more usable, for example, uh, there is still a possibility for anyone who does care about privacy to actually uh, create systems where you have a hosting provider and the hosting provider knows nothing about your data. And there are lots of these systems. Yeah. We implement mm -hmm. them every day. And they are also in the cloud. They are also on someone else's computer. Uh, but that someone else doesn't have access. Uh, first, Thank you for the talk. I really enjoyed that. Thank you. Um, I especially like the feedback loop um, and uh, the, the example with the ship at the beginning. Um, the GDPR is the regulation, so it's, it's, it's a law. So most of the, there are basically two, two ways to tackle that for companies. One is IT, technology, encryption, whatever host in your own data center. The other one is contracts. So if I have a contract with my cloud provider and the cloud provider you know, can agree to certain terms, it's perfectly fine that I store customer data in the cloud if the cloud provider is not allowed to access the data. So if the cloud provider breaks the contract, I mean, he's, you know, I cannot be responsible for that. Um, but the question is, you know, the, the, the two venues, IT versus contracts, do you have any hunch on, on which way it will go? So w will it all be like contracts will be different, but IT stays the same? Or will, you know, m really work, more money go towards good privacy in IT? Um, are, are you saying that, okay, so we have systems that are uh, d not designed with privacy by design. And these systems still have a contract saying, we will not look at your data. Um, so there is no, nothing to, that is technically prohibiting them from doing it, but we just have their pionierium word. Um, <laughs> they just promise that, like, we're not going to do this, we promise. Um, I am. Um, what do I think? Since I'm a security geek, I will, I of course, think that everybody will think that end to end encryption is the only way to go and that we will stop creating systems uh, that give uh, people uh, on, uh, the possibility of unauthorized access. Uh, so that we don't have to trust people's words, that we can assume breach and so on. Um, of course that's what I think, and of course that's what I'm hoping, because I'm an optimist. Okay, it, just one last word. I think our job as IT specialists is to show companies that the cheaper way is to make it really secure. Because in case of, you said Signal, if they get a data breach, they, they, should, they couldn't care less. But you know, if other companies get a data breach, uh, contracts don't help. And then it could potentially get expensive. And, and I think that Signal would care if they would have a data breach. Yeah, but but they, are thinking, <laughs> they, are, they are thinking in advance, and they also have processes in place to mitigate when uh, there is a potential yeah, th for, that's so true, yeah. but you know, GDPR-wise, yeah, they yeah, yeah, wouldn't exactly. care. There was um, actually, I wanted to come back to your question concerning the cloud topic. So I would argue that it's actually a lot easier to comply with GDPR if you rely on a cloud system, because imagine you want to run, let's say, a multinational company, and you have customer data in Russia, China, Germany, wherever, then it's actually a lot easier if you have a cloud provider that has data sets that are separated 
instead of building and running your own on-premise system in all these countries. So would you agree that the cloud helps or do you see it's a um, threat to GDPR? Um, I always use the cloud. <laughs> no, um, I, I think that the cloud is here to stay, basically, and it uh, makes a lot of sense to make um, that people that uh, have a special, uh, that are specialists, um, like from my um, uh, from my experience, most programmers aren't very interested in making uh, systems administration, and uh, why should you? have people be generalists uh, and do things that they think are boring uh, when they can do things that they think are fun. Uh, so I think that um, the cloud uh, enables very many people to uh, focus on what they like uh, so that cloud providers can do this thing that they nerd out about and uh, people do, that do products can do what they nerd out about. I'm, I don't know, I'm pro-cloud with primacy by design in mind. No more questions, I have more candies. There's a, <laughs> but you don't, get, you don't get two candies. Is it not uh, cloud uh, as, as design? I will formulate my question. When we talk about Google, how Google uh, use the data is not cloud as a design to use these places to access this data as a ne next stepping stone in, in uh, extracting data about people. So somebody had great idea in Google Office, we make our services, we make smartphones, we make Gmail, and so uh, etc. And then we say, oh, but we need to have a diesel or Sprit. So, so we, we use uh, these cloud services, and from these cloud services, we use this data for analysis. So are is, you is saying... It, it, yeah, analysis on design. Are you saying that uh, there is nothing um, that technically prohibits a service like uh, Google Docs from extract exactly. extracting uh, industrial, uh, from doing industrial espionage? Exactly. Yes. Um, I'm definitely not saying that Google is doing that. I am saying that I have heard of companies that have decided against using this kind of system because of the possibility yeah, that they're not uh, technically prohibited from doing industrial espionage. Yes. Will GDPR make data more valuable? Well, I think that this... Um, uh, paradigm of uh, data is the new oil, collect em everything uh, just in case, and it will be uh, what could possibly go wrong if we collect all these things and we sell them to a third party, whatever. Um, well, anecdotally, I've heard very much about how having so much data that you're collecting just in case you might need it uh, will instead inhibit you from doing the interesting machine learning that you actually wanted to do in the first place with this data in the new oil paradigm. So if you're actually going through the privacy impact assessment first and you see what do we really want to know, uh, how can we really find these things out, we may find out that, well, this quantitative assessment maybe wasn't what we wanted to do in the first place. Maybe we want to do more interviews and then you end up doing um, th then you end up doing a better analysis on uh, the people who are using your product but at the same time you're also not invading their privacy um, also if you're 
actually looking at what, what is my research question uh, and collect that kind of data, uh, then you might actually not end up with uh, a hoard. You, you won't hoard data anymore, but you will actually collect the data that you need, and you will actually develop the minimally viable product that you wanted to do in the first place. Yeah, so maybe. <laughs>